Hello there, everybody, and a huge welcome to today's Q webinar from the Curious Piano Teachers. And we're delighted today to be welcoming uh, Penelope Roskill, and I'll be talking a bit more about Penelope in a moment. But of course, she's going to be talking about her brand new books, Essential Piano Technique, and taking us through them a little bit. My name is Dr. Sally Cathcart, and I am one of the directors of the Curious Piano Teachers. And I've been joined today as well by the wonderful Hannah O'Toole. Give us a wave, Hannah. And Hannah is our, our community manager. And she'll be popping back later in the, uh, in the webinar to tell you a little bit more about the community. If you're not um, part of our community, and I know there will be lots of people on the call, I can just glance down the chat already and see people who are community members. Um, and if you're not on uh, our mailing list, uh, we have something called a curiosity zone, which goes out with and then put together and that's going out tonight. We'd love to keep in contact with you. And I know Hannah's going to be sharing our sign up list as well as um, getting on our mailing list. You get a free ebook about how to power up your piano teacher. So um, Hannah's going to put that link in the chat for you and do feel free just to click on that and get onto our mailing list. We're also joined, you can't see Claire at the moment, by Claire, Claire Waters, I think it is, who is the marketing executive at Faber Music. But of course, we're really all here for, um, to, to hear about Penelope Roskell and her new books, Essential Piano Technique. If you've already got hold of these, we'd love to hear about it in the chat. Um, and I would suggest, like me, you have them ready if you've already got them, and then you can write things on it. That's what I like to do, so I don't forget. If you've got questions as we go along, please put them in the question and answer session. There is a little, uh, a little tab at the bottom. Put them in the question and answer. If you put them in the chat, we'd love you to chat amongst yourselves, but if you put your questions in the chat, we lose them. So there is a question and answer button. Get your questions in there, because I know Penelope is really looking forward to having lots and lots of questions from you all. So oh, let me introduce Penelope a little more formally. Penelope, thank you so much for coming to join us with this uh, webinar. And I know I'm certainly looking forward to it. Now, many of you will be familiar with um, Penelope's previous book, this I need weight lifter just to pick it up. This wonderful volume called The Complete Pins, which came out in 2020. And really, this is a life, a life, life's work, I think. The dedication that Penelope has put into this is just amazing. And the detail and um, the care as well. And of course, I know Penelope for a few years and having a healthy approach to playing the piano, to being an artist at the piano, really is at the core of that book and I know of the essential piano technique. Penelope is also um, Professor of Piano and Piano Pedagogy at the Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance in London. So she has a vast amount of experience of teaching the piano, at coaching, and at helping people play the piano in really healthy and um, artistic ways. Penelope, we are absolutely delighted that you have come to join us. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, let you talk us through the whole thing. Penelope. Thank you so much, Sally. And uh, I'm delighted to be with you all. I, I'm seeing some very familiar names. Um, I know some of you are familiar with my work, some of you are already saying that you've got the books already. Um, so I'm going to try and um, satisfy some of the questions from all of you, whether you know some of my work already or not. Sally, would you mind just putting the slides up? Yep, just going to do that right now. Okay. okay. Next yeah, next slide please, Sally. So um, these are the, the three books that I've just finished writing. Um, they're, they count as Primer A, Primer B, and then Level 1. So they're called Hop, Skip and Jump, Making Waves, and Leaping Ahead in that order. Um, and they're all heading towards 
a very, very high grade one level. Um, Sally, could you just go on to the next slide? So what I'm going to talk to, about today is, is why I wrote the books, why I wrote them how they are, and, and to explain the rationale behind them, I'm going to give you some examples of a few of the techniques and explain how they are approached, and then give you some suggestions about how to teach the books. So hopefully within what I'm saying, I'll be answering quite a lot of your questions that I know you already have. Um, but as, I, as Sally said, please do add any more questions to the chat. Sally, next slide. So um, I find many teachers um, find it difficult to, to fit in teaching into their regular uh, routine, teaching technique. Um, and there are various reasons for that. One of the, is them, of course, is that we all have shortage of time. Lessons are never quite long enough to fit everything in. Um, but I do find that if you spend that little bit of extra time teaching really sound, solid technique at the beginning, then it saves huge amounts of time later on. They won't come across all those pitfalls and all those frustrations when they're at the intermediate level. All the technique basis is there and they just build on that for years to come. The other thing is that technique has traditionally been seen as rather boring. It's the boring part of the lesson, so let's skip over it as quickly as we can. So let me explain that what I'm talking about here when I'm talking about essential piano technique, I'm using that in the broadest possible sense. So I'm not just talking about finger technique or scales and arpeggios. I'm including a lot more creative ideas, um, how to create a beautiful sound, how to play expressively, singing a shapely phrase, um, leaps, chords, rotation, glissandi, dynamic contrast, the whole range of sounds that we're going to use at the piano. Um, so this isn't just about how we play with the fingers, it's about how we coordinate the whole body, the, whole, the arms, the shoulders, even the back, in flowing movements at the piano. Um, the other thing is that I believe that students are much more happy to learn technique and we're much happier to teach it if it's got a clear purpose, if they understand why they're doing it. So all the techniques I hear are musically focused. So for each one, we start with a very broad um, uh, warm-up exercise. Then we turn it into a very simple technique exercise um, at the piano. And then we immediately move into a piece of music. So they can really see the benefit immediately of these exercises that they're doing. Um, and we've tried to turn every technique into a really fun activity. Um, the words are fun, the music is fun, um, there's lots of games and, and things to do. Um, and I think the other reason why, why a lot of teachers are, are rather lacking in confidence uh, in teaching is because they feel they're not quite sure how to go about it. So what we try to do is give you lots of teacher support. So there's good um, explanations on the page in a very child-friendly way, but at the back of the book, um, there are some very detailed teacher's notes explaining the purpose of each exercise and more details about how to teach that exercise. And also a video that you can access showing you the, um, uh, the, the exercise in more detail. Sally, if you'd like to take down the, the slides now and I'll just talk in general. So, a lot of people ask me, um, so yeah, we can just leave it now, thanks. Uh, a lot of people ask me why I wrote these books. Um, and the thing is that I have um, been teaching pianists of all levels all my life, from beginners right through to professional. And what I see very often is that um, even uh, very advanced pianists have a lot of technical frustrations, hindrances, which I can see stem from, and they often admit this themselves, stem from something they were taught earlier on or something that they weren't taught earlier on. So what we're trying to do here is to make sure that they learn all the really best aspects of technique right from the beginning stages so they don't reach those levels of tension or, or frustration later on. Um, so 
for years, I've found myself saying in pedagogy classes, somebody needs to write a book that addresses these problems. And uh, guess what? I ended up finding myself doing it. Um, so I've made some quite radical changes um, to the way we approach technique. And so I think it's useful if I explain some of those to you today, so you understand why I've done things. Um, so, as I say, I've tried to teach all aspects of technique um, so that they understand everything. So we're covering a lot more than is usually covered in a technique book at the, this level. Um, but they are techniques that will last them a lifetime. We're also aiming to achieve real freedom of movement at the piano um, around the whole keyboard. So we involve them playing right across the whole keyboard from the beginning. Um, and I teach them freedom of movement in all directions. Now, by that I mean, even in the first book, we're talking about up-down movements, which of course we use to, to create the sound, to, to press the key. Sideways movement, which we use to, to get to move around the keyboard, to get to all the way to the upper notes and so on. I even talk about forward and back movements, so confident movement between the white notes and the black notes. And I even, in, even in book one, the primer A, introduce a little bit of rotation. So they're getting freedom in all these different types of movement. So we start with the movement in a very broad way. We're using, the, the warm-ups are using movements that they would use in their normal everyday life. So they're movements that they recognize. Um, and these are done usually away from the piano initially. They can stand up, they can move around the room, so it gives a little bit of variety in the piano lesson. Um, and then we do that same movement as a simple exercise at the piano. And then we put it into a piece that focuses almost exclusively on that particular technique so they can really concentrate on it. And most of these pieces are written as a duet. So they've got a beautiful, very imaginative accompaniment. So even if they're only at the very beginning stages, they can get a, quite a rich musical experience. Now, one of the first things you'll find is that we don't use the middle C approach. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but I'll explain it anyway. Um, if I bring my hand up towards the piano, it's going to be more comfortable when my hand is roughly in front of my shoulder. Now, as soon as I go to play both thumbs on middle C, which is how I was taught and how many of us were taught, you see various things happening. So there, look, my arm looks comfortable, it's nicely rounded, everything looks a very natural position. As soon as I come here, the shoulders come in, the elbows come in, and most importantly, the hand starts to twist. So instead of having, you see what happens, my arm is now in line somewhere between the second and finger and the thumb. That's what we call on a deviation. And so what I'm wanting to do is to use the hand in its most natural position. So we're always using the hand more in this position, so the arm is more in line with the third finger. So we avoid that muscular imbalance, which can cause many, many problems later on. Um, so we're starting by aiming, teaching them to move freely around the keyboard. And in doing that, what they're doing is learning to coordinate the use of the hand with the whole arm. So we start, for instance, with an exercise that I just call rainbows, and all they're doing is an exercise where we call floating over the rainbow. So what they're learning there is to move the whole arm, and it floats lightly from one note to the next. But they're just doing it in the air. And then I say, can you drop the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? So they're learning to sort of drop and then float, drop, float, which is exactly the movement that they're going to do. Um, initially, just on some black notes, they're just going to do that. So they're learning to coordinate the whole arm in a slightly exaggerated but beautiful movement. And then when they've done that, they start to just play it on the D instead with the third finger. I always use the third finger to start because it's in the centre of the hand, so it keeps everything really well balanced. And then we just do finding all the Ds, for instance. Um, and I use that, I call it a bobbing technique. Um, and then 
we just introduce that technique in, in a very simple piece. So we're using all the notes of the piano, so obviously these can't be learned on the stave. So all of these initial pieces will be taught by road. You're, they're very simple little patterns that are repeated. So you can quickly teach the, the student the pattern and then they'll soon be able to play the complete piece. So one of the main aims of Primer A is to establish a healthy hand shape. Um, now, if I'm just rest my hand by my side, let it go flop, shake it around a bit and then lift it up, that is my hand shape. It's, everybody's different, it's a little bit different for everybody, but that is my natural hand shape. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that each student is developing and feeling familiar with their natural hand shape at the piano. So um, we, what we do in this book is introduce not one note at a time. So we're not starting with C, middle C, D, middle C, B, and then moving out to E and so on. We're starting with just some black notes so they're easy to find and we're introducing one finger at a time. Um, and this allows them time to just focus on that finger and to make sure that they're playing it really well, especially when you get to the fourth finger, the fifth finger and even the thumb, which tends to collapse in that way. So it gives them time to really make sure they're playing each finger well. Um, so we, as I say, we start with the third finger. Um, I, if they like, I call it, this is the eagle beak. They put the thumb behind the end joint. So this keeps the, the, the finger really nice and rounded. And then we just play a few tunes. So um, I don't call this Mary Had a Little Lamb. I call it Can You Catch a Kangaroo? So they just go. And then they hop like the kangaroo. So there's a few little added movements just to keep the arm flowing, to, to keep their attention alive. Um, so then we start to add in the other fingers. Um, but we don't do that in a C major hand position um, because if you start immediately on a C major hand position, what tends to happen is they tend to curl the fingers a little bit more than is needed. In fact, some books tell you to curl your hand as if you're holding an apple or holding an egg. And I find that's unnaturally curved. It's not necessary. We want to use the natural hand position. And Chopin used this position where the, um, so I'll do it here so you can see it better, um, where the second, third and fourth finger are playing black notes and the thumb and the five are playing white notes. So I tend to call that the Chopin hand position because he used it with all his beginners because he recognized that that was the most natural position for the hand to be placed on the piano. It's where we tend to land if we just drop our hand on the piano. So we're using that position at the beginning, which means that we're not doing it through note reading again. We're doing it with just stick notes on the stave. Um, and so they look at the pattern and all the pieces are very pattern based, so they're easy to read by rote. Um, so for instance, um, one of the pieces which um, Armand Burroughs has written most of the pieces, um, which very cleverly just uses that five finger pattern, um, the melody just goes like this. So it's using precisely those five fingers in a very natural way. And the way the teacher accompaniment has a little introduction, so they have to listen to the introduction and know when to come in. exactly the same pattern but in reverse it's in contrary motion um, so in all the pieces what we're trying to do is to make sure that the left hand is exercised absolutely equally so every technique is covered in the right hand and the left hand equally so by this stage they'll have introduced all the fingers and they should have a really nice hand shape and um, so when they actually come to play on the white notes, they'll already have that nice hand shape. They won't be doing this. They'll just be used to just putting their hand on the piano and these fingers will just reach out to, to where they naturally seem to land. 
Um, now, this does mean that when we come to some of the pieces, I, once we get into the note reading, I tend to write around the middle C area. But we, I give very clear instructions to the teacher in the book to, wherever possible, to then play it an octave higher or an octave lower, so that you see you're always getting into that really comfortable hand position and you're trying to get away from that rather more uncomfortable position. So, of course, they'll be playing sometimes in the middle C area, but not all the time. We're getting them to keep moving around the whole keyboard. Can I, can I just interrupt here a moment, Penelope, to say I'm bouncing up and down with excitement, of course, because this whole idea of moving us away, for, moving the child away from that middle C position, which can be really quite damaging, can't it? Especially you're, you're, you're emphasising the fact that these are all happening by rote. Mm. rather than by reading because reading is a completely different skill and you want this the, the technique to develop without having the overload of, of trying to yeah. read the notes as well exactly yeah 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 so, very um, very important yeah thank so, you uh yeah thank you sally <laughs> um so and um so there are a few things though that i do quite differently um, from the traditional technique books and even from the traditional method books. So I want to explain why I'm doing these. And I have introduced some things in a different order, which I think is better and, and produces a more healthy result. One of these is that I introduced legato quite late on. As you can see, the pieces that I was doing there, Can You Catch a Kangaroo, Once I Met a Man, um, are all uh, played detached initially. And that's because when you're playing detached, you've got the whole coordination of the arm behind the finger. So little weak fingers, if you've got a very young child, they'll be able to play the notes quite confidently. Legato is actually a finger touch. You can't use the arm behind it. It's just the movement of the finger. So that's quite a lot more challenging. And we've all seen things happening. So the hand collapses or, or they're playing this and then these ones are coming up. Um, or, or that in order to press the fourth finger down, they start to tense up the wrist. So a lot of problems can happen if we introduce legato too early. So what I've done is I've introduced quite a lot of sort of playful, very simple finger strengthening exercises and given them lots of detached um, pieces to learn before they start to play legato. And the other thing is that I don't introduce chords um, very early either. Um, because again, that can lead to uh, a lot of pressure. Just trying to put down three fingers and not the others mean that sometimes these other fingers stick up. All sorts of things can go wrong. So again, it's good to prepare for those and do them at the right time. Uh, and I'll show you later how I, how I lead towards preparing chords in a step-by-step -step way. And exactly um, as Sally was saying, um, I'm trying to avoid um, overload. So I'm using a very much a step-by-step -step approach. And, you know, as we all know, there's so many things to take in on the piano. There's um, the note reading. There's two hands. There's fingering. There's rhythm. There's so many things going on. And on top of that, there's the movements that we're using. So if we've got, say, something chordal in the left hand and something melodic in the right, sometimes what happens is that the two movements become compromised you end up playing something similar in both hands you don't have a clear staccato chord in the left and a beautiful singing melody in the right for instance um, so what we've done is we've kept the note learning extremely simple as simple as possible with things being reused repeated and so on so they're not spending a lot of time focusing on that so they can really put all their attention into the feeling of the movement what the movement feels like and how it sounds. So they're really listening. Um, so we do a lot of hand separate practice for a long time. And only then, when they're really getting good at each technique, do we start to add it in in, in contrary motion and then eventually in parallel motion. And then starting to combine one technique with another in the other hand. Um, uh, one thing people often ask me is about dynamic contrast. And again, I think sometimes we tried to introduce a forte finger touch too early. And for small children, um, this is very hard because if they're trying to play forte with just a finger, they're going to start tensing up the wrist, they're going to start pressing unnecessarily. So we only introduce forte um, with the support of the arm, so it's detached playing. 
Um, and I use lots of imagery. So for instance, I'll, I'll give them a choice and I'll say, how do you want to play this? Can you try playing it like a grasshopper? Can you try, try playing it like a kangaroo? So they'll get the sense of a very light little grasshopper or a, or a kangaroo. And there's a, a rather silly piece, uh, which I call forte piano, uh, where they're just playing the forte, forte, and so they're using the energy of the arm to do that, and they play the piano notes, piano. So they do this. Um, it's just a, a little silly thing, um, but it actually is giving them the idea that they use more energy of the arm for the forte and a more gentle arm for the piano. Um, we use images, say, for instance, the difference between playing like a ping pong ball or playing like a basketball. Um, so we're trying to keep everything as simple as possible um, and keep the note learning simple so they can really listen. And what we're trying to do also is to keep it inspiring and intriguing. And it's interesting that the little character that is the little cat who gives practice tips is called Curious Cat. So it actually goes very well uh, in sync with the, with the Curious Piano teachers. Um, so we're trying to keep it fun. We've got amusing words, we've got gaming activities. And, and feel free to move around the, the, the room when you're introducing the, the warm-ups and so on. So I'm going to demonstrate two, two aspects of technique to you. Um, so firstly, I'm going to talk about how we introduce legato. And so we, I've already sort of given you the, the lead up to it, because what we're doing here is in the rainbow, we're firstly learning to coordinate the whole arm, and we're learning to drop using gravity at the notes at the end of the rainbow. So then that leads quite nicely into an, a, a, a technique I call the parachute touch. Those of you who've got my book, The Complete Pianist, will be very familiar with this. So forgive me for repeating it. I'll just do a quick summary. But what we're doing is, again, just dropping into the note using, um, using gravity. So they start with a, a, an exercise we call the trumpeting elephant. So they do the elephants, they do a big movement, and then they learn to just drop down as though they're a cat hanging from a parachute. Um, so they're learning to just drop into the note rather than pressing into the note. And the piece we use um, to demonstrate that is Packabell's Cannon. Um, so they're just doing this, it's very simple. And they do it with one finger. And of course the teacher can add in the accompaniment they do it with different fingers and eventually they can do it in with thirds. That comes a bit later, obviously. Um, so then we lead from that the idea of dropping into single notes to drop into the single notes and then continue on walking. So you're transferring the weight from finger to finger. So we do this on our knee, call it drop and walk away from home. Um, and then we just drop and walk on the spot in that way. And then we use that um, on the piano and we just get the sense of transferring the weight from one finger to the next. And then we may start to do it and it adds in a little bit of rotation as we're adding in a slightly bigger intervals. So they start to learn to get a really warm singing legato sound. And then this turns into one of the pieces. One of my favorites is called I'm a Flabby Tabby Cat. And it goes like this. So we drop into the first note. I'm a Flabby Tabby Cat. So it's just one phrase. And they've learned to drop and then transfer the weight so each note sings. And then what they do at the end of the phrase, the hand comes up, just relaxes, and they parachute down. they've learned to drop in, they've learned a beautiful sound, they've also learned a singing phrase and they've learned to, to breathe between the phrases. So I'm also going to talk very briefly about um, how I introduce chords. And um, as I said I introduce them a little bit later 
than most books do. And we start with introducing just an open fifth. So again, we would do that and get the feeling of dropping onto them. So here, I'm just dropping onto an open fifth in this way. So I'll do it on the other hand so you can see better. Right. Now, what we do is we turn that into an exercise I call the nodding bird. So the idea is that the bird is just sort of pecking at the food, so it's doing that movement. So it's a down, up with the wrist. So we're doing... So they're adding in the third finger. But because the third finger is coming in on an up, it can't do that. So you don't end up with the hand collapsing as you play the chord. So, so what we're just doing here is doing that and then playing the four chord. And by that stage, they should have a really beautiful hand shape for the chord. They're dropping in, they're not putting any unnecessary weight. They're not sticking up the, the non-playing fingers. They should be feeling really comfortable about it. So when they've got that, then they can start to play detached chords. So again, we'd start with just, um, just staccato ones. And I call this jellyfish jumps. And we start with this um, away from the piano again, as we always do with quite a big movement. And so we ask them to sort of imagine that there are jellyfish swimming through the sea. And they can just do it on the spot or they can start to move around. Okay, so what you'll find there is just by using that image of the jelly, the jellyfish, what happens is their hand becomes very, very relaxed as they come up. Because so often we see people playing chords and in between the chords, the hand is very tight. So we're looking for relaxation between the chords. <coughs> so what they do then is they just then start to put that on an open fifth. So it's, I call it Jim the jellyfish. It's just a very simple exercise and all they're doing is up it's very very relaxed um, now and so then all we need to do is to add in the third so again we'll do it um, just by doing adding the third later and then start to play the whole triad and I do want to share with you the piece um, that Aaron has written for this um, it's so simple for the pupil, all they're doing is an F major chord and an E major chord. So they're already using the black notes, they're using quite a wide range of, of keys. Um, and so they're just doing this. And right hand. And it might seem rather boring to the pupil until they get to the lesson and the teacher plays this with it. So it becomes this fantastic piece with, with wonderful character and it's the sort of thing they could play and really bring the house down in a concert. So I'm going to um, talk a little bit about how I suggest you might use these books. Um, so as I said before, they're really aimed at um, to cover a student, I don't like to specify either a time scale or an age or anything. Um, therefore, younger children, you, as you can see from the um, from the, the graphics of them, I'll show you some in a minute. Um, they're really aimed for the first two or three years. Now, of course, we all know that some whiz through books really quickly and some need to take a lot longer. So they can be used very flexibly. They'll take a student to a very high level of grade one. So they will, they will have every technique they could possibly meet at, in grade when one pieces. Um, that, that means to say, but they're also, they've learned all the basic um, techniques that are actually going to keep them going for years to come. So there's a huge amount of content in these books. Um, there are, as you can see, it only goes up to level one. Um, there are some level twos and level three um, due, um, which hopefully will be uh, next summer. Um, you can combine them with exams. Um, the Primer A and Primer B are really leading up to the UK initial exam level. 
Um, and the level one is, is going up to grade one. It will cover them to a very, very high grade one level. Um, and yes, you can combine them with any other method book um, or with a repertoire book or a theory book or just use them on their own. There are many different ways that you can use them. And I know I've already spoken to quite a few teachers who are using them in quite imaginative ways. Um, so I think it depends on the experience of the teacher. Um, and so uh, it's, it's worth spending some time, perhaps over this summer, if you have the books already, um, to think about how you would use them when your new teach pupils start in, in the autumn. Um, there's plenty of tu tu teacher support in the books. And a lot of the pages, actually, the wording is really intended slightly more for you. Um, and then you just do the exercise with the student. Um, um, so I think it's really helpful if you've got a good sense of all the techniques yourself, you've looked at the videos, you know what it's about um, before you delve into the books with actual students. Um, I do encourage um, teachers to use quite a flexible approach. I'm, I'm very flexible as a teacher um, and, and I admire that in other teachers. Um, you know, take, take note of the age of the child, of the character of the child. Some, some want to, are very good at reading straight away, so you can start with reading quite early on. Some want to learn by rote. Um, that's, you know, you can teach some of the ones that are already written on the stage by rote if you prefer. Some would take time to move through, some will want to move through really quickly. Um, others will need to take more time. If you've got a child who's really absorbing everything really quickly, and um, there are extension activities at the bottom of each section. Um, so these might reinforce a technique by developing it a little further. They might suggest that you improvise on it. Um, it might suggest explaining a little bit more about the theory, so you modulate into a different key or something. Um, so those are for students who just want a, a little bit more practice or want to develop it further. Um, and we're really trying to, uh, in, to develop creativity and imagination here. So not only are there activities at the, at the end of each section for developing things in, in improvisation in a way if you want, um, again, I would leave the teacher to, to do that in the way that you feel most comfortable. Um, but even with some of the pieces, I, I specifically asked Aaron, can we not put in the dynamic markings here? Can we ask the student how they want to play it? How do they imagine this piece? What's it about? Um, what, how do they want to play it very energetically? Is it very quiet? How do the different movements that you're making change the sound and create that sound that you want? So we're in, in trying to develop the sense of curiosity. Um, so these are not just technique books. They are really repertoire books as well, and they're musicianship books. So they're really teaching how to teach technique in a very artistic way. Um, I've, as you can see, I've, I've thought very carefully about the order in which I introduce the techniques. Um, but with some students, you probably will need to change the order once in a while. You know, if they're doing a piece in, in, for an exam or in, a, in a, another book, um, and it introduces a technique that you haven't covered yet, you can always jump ahead and start to introduce that technique. Um, you might, for instance, have a transfer student um, who you feel has missed out on some of the techniques, and you might want to just dip in and out and pull some of these sections out. Um, I find the techniques are also absolutely relevant for adults. We haven't written an older version book, version of it yet, um, but I am currently creating an, an online version um, where we're teaching adults how to use these techniques. Um, so it, I'm... I think you can use it for older people, but obviously you'd have to just pick out certain things and omit some of the child-friendly language. So I think one way to think of it is to think of, you know, what you're doing is you're, you're buying all these tools, you're putting them in the toolbox, so you're learning all these techniques, all these skills, and you're filling up the toolbox with them. So that when you see that the pupil is going to be doing a piece and a performance, and that it's got that those three techniques in that piece, you're going to perhaps revise, learn or revise those pe particular techniques so that when they come to play the piece, it's easy. Because what we, I'm trying to do is to, is to make piano playing feel easy, um, for them to be able to enjoy it and, and get real joy out of it. 
Um, and they can't do that if they're struggling. So the more you can actually just look ahead, think, hmm, they're going to need that exercise, that technique soon. I'll introduce that. You could introduce it a little bit earlier if you wanted to. Or you can just follow the, the sequence step by step as I've done it, which I hope will really make a lot of sense to all of you. Um, they can then put the techniques into practice um, in other pieces. Um, so I, I've, I've given a list of some related pieces at the end of the book, so do have a look at those. Um, Sally, could you just put up the next lot of slides? Because um, I just want to show you a few sample pages and explain what's, what's on these pages. Next one, please. This one? Yeah. Next one. All right. There we go. Yeah. So what we're trying to do all the time is use imagery to explain things to children, because a lot of the, the beginning children won't want to be reading a lot. So we, ju we just use the image of Sleepy Spider, which is your relaxed hand on your hand. And then you just turn your hand over and that's your wide awake spider. And then, but you, what you have to avoid is your squashed spider. So we just have these little images that then stay very clear in the, um, in the, in the hand, so you keep referring to them, don't use your squash spider hand here, or you can use these little images. Uh, next one, please, Sally. Um, so this is a, a, a piece, I'm sorry, it's rather small, it's a bit difficult to see. Um, so this is a, a piece that's actually only using two notes and two fingers. Um, so it's a very simple pattern, but what we've done is, so here we're not using the staves, so it's right at the beginning of book one. Um, a primer A and so you can see at the top there's a little keyboard so they know which notes to play there's a little picture to inspire them to create the right sort of atmosphere it's a cowboy in this in with this with the stars and the moon um, there's a little cat symbol giving you advice about how to play it and there's the teacher part at the bottom of the page the accompaniment and there's a little space to put your stars or your little well dones at at the end um, Sally next next one doesn't seem to be moving on at the moment. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, well, I just had another couple of images. Um, hmm, that's odd. Okay. Let me just see if I can get out. Is my computer frozen generally? There we go. Oh, there we are. That was it. There yeah. we are. So, as you can then. see, what this one is doing is demonstrating the cat. So, you don't have to show them all the wording because the cat is, the cat is coming down from a parachute and it's going to land on its feet. It's not going to splat flat. So, we're landing um, with the hand in a really good hand shape. So that's what the pictures are demonstrating, the movement for the child. And the next one, Sally, if you can. Um, so this is showing you the jellyfish jumps. It's got these sweet little pictures of very soft, squeegee jellyfish, just to inspire them to have the right movement in their hands. Um, and Sally, could we just go on to the last slide? Uh, right, so um, I just wanted to tell you that um, these books are um, published by Edition Peters with Faber Music. Um, Faber has offered a 20% reduction for uh, members of this, of this webinar uh, and for Curious Penner teachers. Um, and so there's a code, I don't know if you can see it there, I can't see it because I've got my pictures on the side, and it's uh, PR20. Um, so you can get a 20% reduction. And if you're in the States, ah, it hasn't come up on that, um, you'd get them from Alfred. So it's alfred.com. And you can use the same code PR20 uh, for the reduction for the books. Um, if you start using these books and want some further sort of support um, as, you're, as you're going through them, um, do sign up to the Roskill Academy, roskillacademy.com. And uh, then you'll get newsletters, which will, they don't come every week, don't worry, it's only every few months. Um, and tell you about training courses, support groups, and so on. For instance, there's a, if you're on Facebook, there's a Roscoe Academy piano group where people exchange ideas and, and experiences. Um, and if you just mention that you're a member of Curious Piano Teachers, you'll be well, very welcome on that group. Um, and also this, the course, the online course, um, that I've created, which is for teachers, and, and it's um, the idea is that it teaches all the techniques that you'd be doing in the beginners' books, but it also shows you how to 
adapt those techniques to use for intermediates and advanced teaching. Um, and again, um, there's a discount code for that. It's um, Technique 22, and there's a 20% reduction for curious panda teachers uh, for that. So I thought you'd, you can find details about that on the Royal School Academy website. Um, Hannah, do you want to open it up to any further questions? We do have a question, actually, Penelope, mm -hmm. which um, is from Rachel Hind. And right. Rachel says, I have a very able five-year-old pupil whose hand is a bit too little to comfortably play in a five-finger position. Mm -hmm. How would you advise? How much of these books would be useful? Um, and this child is quick to read and understand and was reading at the age of three. So it's it's a physical hand size problem, I think. Yes, okay. Um, I think we, most of the people, so again, I, I'm encouraging you to you do things very flexibly. Um, I think some of the pieces, um, you know, for instance, this one, the cowboy song that I mentioned, it's two, three, two, and it could be two, two, four, four, two, four, two, for instance. So they can change the fingerings a little bit if they want. Some of the exercises are actually just repeating on one finger as well. So I think it can be modified. Um, and I think she should just experiment and, and does that answer the, qu the question sufficiently? I mean, hopefully her hand will grow anywhere. She works her way through the book. So by primer B, she may well be big enough to do the play in, in the five finger position. We have been, so with the Chopin hand position, we didn't use, Chopin actually uses E, sorry, I'll do it down here, E, F sharp, so here, whereas actually I don't do it with the E, I do it with the um, thumb on the E sharp, so it, it's again, it's keeping it in a nice small, a, a smaller hand position as possible. So again, it, it's something that you can be as flexible as you like on. Okay, well, hopefully that's, that's answered Rachel's, uh, Rachel's questions about that, but uh, I think that if there, anybody's got any other questions, then, oh yes, we have more coming in now, of course. Um, <laughs> so um, somebody else is asking, would they adapt well on a digital piano? They have a softer touch often, which leads to students having a weaker technique. Yeah, mm. but I, I, I've, I've designed them so that they're absolutely equally can be used on a digital piano or on a keyboard, you know, or on, on an acoustic piano. They can be used for either. I mean, obviously, they're not going to get, if, if it's not touch sensitive, they're not going to get the dynamic contrast. Um, but hopefully they'll be exploring that when they come for the lesson on, on your piano. So um, they'll still get the benefit from all the exercises. So you can add yeah. that in as the extra, uh, you know, in the lesson time. Yeah, they'll still get the benefit and, and still have a, a healthier approach, healthier yeah, approach. And it the should be all the exercises. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I hope that helps you. Um, all right, slightly off top. Um, Ijeom was just asking if there are a webinar on the complete pianist. I'm sure there's something out there about that. Isn't there? I think I did one for you, didn't I? I think you did. <laughs> I think Ijeom, you need to go and look on the website. Three so I'm sure ago, there's something probably. there. Go and <laughs> put it in the search. And yeah. Susan Anderson's asking, um, <laughs> of course, where did you get your wonderful one octave dummy piano keyboard from, please? Oh, <laughs> that's slightly <laughs> off, off topic. Right, this now, this is a, a completely different topic. This um, keyboard is very useful for these occasions when I want to demonstrate something. It's actually a smaller sized keyboard. And I don't know if you know about these. Um, it's very useful, especially for smaller children. Mm. They can practice on a smaller keyboard. Um, because the problem about keyboards, they're all designed for very large men. Um, an octave is a strain for quite a lot of pianists. And um, the average piano hand size is about eight inches 20 centimeters i think um and i always used to think i had quite big hands but actually mine are slightly smaller than average um and uh, so i think it's very important for children in particular not to overstretch them and i think there is a a, a a sort of myth really that we should be trying to stretch their hands to try and make them bigger but hands can't be made bigger they are as they are you know and they grow and then they that's as far as they can get but what you can do is to make sure that your hand 
feels comfortable at a stretch. So you can start to learn to um, stretch, reach out, say for an octave or whatever, but try and feel comfortable about it and do it with a relaxed wrist. So what I'm getting back to here is this was provided for me by an organization for called Pianists for Alternative Sized Keyboards. And if you haven't heard of them, you might like to um, look up, they're called P-A-S-K. And um, they are campaigning for um, increased uh, uh, awareness and availability of, pianists, uh, of pianos and keyboards that are narrower to fit smaller hands. So actually this links up with the comment that um, the, the person made earlier about what do we do with people with small hands. Actually, there's an advantage of using one of those little keyboards that's a little bit narrower because then they get the sense of their hand fits, fits comfortably onto the keyboard. Um, so this one is a plastic sort of printout of a slightly smaller sized keyboard. Um, I have tried the real things. Um, and if you've got a smaller hand, they, they feel absolutely wonderful. Mm, I can imagine. I can imagine. As you say, you know, my keyboards are man size. Um, and so for most of it, I think for most females, we have slightly smaller hands and that would yeah. be really interested um, to, to do that. I can't yeah, wait to try one. I can't wait to yes. try one of those because I have very <laughs> tiny hands. Medea is also saying they should all play the harpsichord as well. Yeah, because the, <laughs> our, our, old, our old keyboard instruments, they were narrow. The keys were narrow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, what Pask says is one size doesn't fit all. No. Um, and you, when you're a violinist, you start with a, with a 16th size violin. Absolutely. And you a full size violin over many, many years. And we don't do that. So um, I think that question that you asked about how we, how we modify things for smaller hands is, is very relevant. Mm, absolutely. Okay, we have another question come in from Justine. Um, and I think it's Justine is a she. I have a, she has a question, would you expect that the three parts of each technique, in other words, off piano, at piano and the piece, should be introduced in the same lesson or separated? And she's been doing them in separate lessons with lots of repetition, but she's only got to bobbing on a D. <laughs> right, okay. I, I think it very much depends on the student. It depends on how long the length of the lesson is. Um, if they find it easy and they're, they're obviously ready to move on, then you could you could fit all three in, into one lesson. Um, if it's a very short lesson, then do it one at a time. It also depends on what. Oh, seem to have lost Penelope. She did warn us, didn't she, <laughs> Hannah? That sometimes her computer just just cancels she out. Did. But yes, she did. and and she's managed to get through most of it. So um, I'll just come in here and say. Hopefully that answered um, that question for you, Justine. But I did notice earlier you also use ready to play. So I think, as, as Penelope said, it's a question of balancing the, the age, et cetera. And if you introduce them like you seem to be doing separately, then maybe you can bring in the ready to play aspect as well for um, other parts of the lesson. So it's all about balance. Penelope, you're back. Yay. Hi. <laughs> it just closed completely. We managed. We kept going. And yeah. we, we I can't even remember what the question was. I'm so shocked. Well, I've I've kind of finished it off for you. It was about introducing things in the same lesson or separate lessons. And I was just saying Justine had commented earlier, she's using your books with my books, with the ready to play book. And I do think they're very complementary in Good. that they do dif develop different skills. So I could see a lesson being having um, off the piano and maybe at the piano part in one lesson with some ready to play going on there. And then you can follow on in the, in the subsequent lesson by continuing with um, a, a piece, for example, yeah. in your book. So you, could, so you could teach them the piece in, in the next lesson. They can go away and practice it. And then they can come back and at the beginning of the next lesson, they're ready to play it with you. So they're playing it with the accompaniment. Um, yeah, but as I say, it, they. Um, I, I'm delighted to hear that it's working alongside Ready to Play. That's fantastic. It, is. it just needs a little bit of sort of thinking outside the box and, and just a little bit of preparation thinking, what can I introduce with this? Um, but then they're, they're very, very compatible, I think, because the, 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 yeah. the philosophy and the principles of it are very, very similar. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm just sitting here thinking, come September or October in the Curious Piano Teachers, our curiosity box is about holistic teaching and looking at the whole child and how to develop the whole child sort of moving forward. And I'm thinking we could explore this. Maybe you and I could even have a webinar for the community together, Penelope, where actually we look at the overlaps and how we can make them work together. We'll leave that one with me because that's just popped into my head. Good idea. <laughs> okay, lovely. Thank you so much. Um, Hannah, I'm just going to pass over to you for a moment because I know you were going to say a little bit more about your role as, as a community manager of the piano teachers before I come back and thank Penelope and we wrap up. Hannah. Thank you, Sally. So just to say there's lots of um, love in the chat already for the books, Penelope, lots of people who are enjoying them already and lots of people using spider hands and all of those things. So my role for the Curious Piano Teachers, I'm community manager. So I look after our fantastic community of piano teachers from all across the world who love to learn as much as they teach. Um, we have a very vibrant and active Facebook group where no question is too small or too silly. <laughs> and it's a very warm and welcoming place place and it's if you imagine a virtual staff room that is kind of the vibe that we that we have going on inside our <laughs> member group the curiosity lounge we also have um, a library of i think we're on box 78 now <laughs> the curious library of um different how-to videos resources um and webinar recordings um exclusively for members and penelope has kindly contributed to some of these in the past for us as well so we have um videos from penelope on teaching classical trills scales and arpeggios and um, lots of other member exclusive con content as well so if you're interested to find out a little bit more of um, what Penelope shared with us in the past or if you want to kind of explore some of the ideas that you have learned today in a safe and supportive community if you want to say well actually how are you using these then the Curious Piano teaches us another great place to do that so we will drop the um, link we've got the ebook link which if you click on the ebook link, you'll get a little bit more information about the Curious Piano Teachers, but it'll also sign you up to our weekly um, mailing list, our weekly email, which we try to make kind of magazine style. We try to make it helpful and a bit of light relief, something that hopefully you'll look forward to in your inbox every week. Um, so there might be a handy teaching tip in there or a blog post that you might find useful. Um, I will also drop the join link just now in the chat as well. At the moment, you get a free trial, so you can trial us out and see what you think. So here it comes. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anna. And thank you to everybody who's come along. We've had uh, uh, over 80 people joining us from all over the world, I have to say. I think almost, almost every continent has been uh, represented during this except Australia maybe, because I think it's a bit early in the morning over there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we'll have to do an, a morning one to catch the Australian markets there. But I want to say a huge thank you, Penelope, for coming to join us for this webinar. It has been really um, very illuminating and exciting to hear about these books and indeed to hear what people have been saying about the metaphors and the analogies that you've used in those already working and saying all they have to do is say and the technique connects itself corrects itself perfect so thank you for sharing um your considerable expertise with us and um oh there is somebody here from australia okay <laughs> right i'll take it back back to my thank you um <laughs> huge thank you to, to to penelope for for sharing everything with us and we do hope that you know we can maybe work together i'm sure we will at something in the future. Yeah, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. And uh, thank you for listening. And yes, I'd be very happy to do something again in the future. Super. Thank you everybody else for coming along and happy, happy piano playing. And remember to stay curious. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>